Okay, uh, my name is Tanish and I'm from the University of Bristol. Uh, I come from a mathematics department, so my talk is going to be a little different. I'm going to be uh, talking about aspects of mathematical modeling of networks, and I hope to convince you that uh, maths is useful in computer science. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to be looking at peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. Uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but anyway, just to start off, uh, what are they useful for? Well, mostly they've been used in content distribution, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, grid and cloud computing uh, also use, well, sometimes they use server farms, but potentially uh, they can also use uh, uh, peer-to-peer -peer approaches. So uh, such approaches are useful in distributed computing as well. Uh, and why might we prefer to do this? Uh, well, for one thing, it doesn't require centralized resources. So uh, you might have uh, Google or Amazon providing you your uh, cloud computing infrastructure, but equally you could just get together with other people and create this infrastructure on your own. Uh, this becomes especially useful as a platform for deploying new services. So uh, if you have uh, uh, well, if you want to introduce a new service into the marketplace uh, and nobody is willing to invest in creating the infrastructure for that, uh, then potentially you could just get together with other people who think there's a market for this and create your own infrastructure. Uh, and by not relying on central resources, it's uh, extremely robust. So you have uh, uh, services which uh, which are robust to, say, failures of uh, some fraction of, of the peers in the network. So uh, take, for instance, BitTorrent, you could have uh, a flash crowd appearing, you could have some large fraction of it disappearing quickly, uh, and the system would still continue to propagate uh, uh, propagate data to the, to the remaining members of the network. Uh, and potentially it can also offer performance benefits by working around bottlenecks and that's that's the whole idea of uh, something like vector okay and what kind of uh, uh, functionality should such a network provide uh, what what do we need of it in order to get all these benefits uh, one of the most basic things we need is connectivity every member uh, accessing the service should be able to communicate with every other member. So, so I use the term node from now on for members or agents using the service. Uh, the nodes shouldn't become isolated uh, so that somebody can't communicate with anybody else and they should also uh, uh, not partition. So you shouldn't have the population splitting up into some groups. Uh, okay. The other, so that's kind of a basic requirement, but we would also like something more. We would like fault tolerance. So uh, the failure of a small number of nodes should not bring down the whole system. Uh, otherwise, we are in the same situation as a centralized service where the central server goes down and the whole system comes down. So it should be possible to cope with failures and Hopefully, uh, it should degrade. The system should degrade gracefully with failure. So, as more and more nodes fail, um, the performance may become poorer, but you shouldn't face uh, kind of a sharp collapse of the system. Uh, and finally, one of the features of many peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks is that uh, the members are not there permanently. So that's. Uh, uh, they are made up of agents who join for a short while and leave, uh, and so these systems should be robust to quite rapid churn of their membership. Okay, so uh, that's uh, as far as peer-to-peer -peer systems go. I'm going to uh, uh, move sideways to talk about random graphs. Uh, these are mathematical models of graphs or networks. They were introduced by or studied in detail by two Hungarian mathematicians, Paul Edrish and Alfred Rennie, starting in the late 50s. Uh, and there's subsequently been a huge body of work on this topic, and I'd like to introduce some of them today. Uh, so uh, just an outline of 
the rest of the talk, I'll introduce uh, a few different random graph models, uh, talk about some of their properties, and show how uh, understanding these models is relevant to design of peer to peer networks. Okay, so, uh, some terminology again might be familiar, but just in case. So, I'll use the term graph or network interchangeably to mean the same thing. It's a collection of nodes and edges. Uh, edges could be directed or undirected. It's a, an edge is a pair of nodes. If the edge is directed, the order of the nodes in the pair matters. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Uh, a path is just a sequence of nodes with an edge between every uh, two ele su successive elements in the sequence. And the graph is connected if there's a path between any two nodes. So if you can go from anywhere to anywhere. Uh, okay, so that's a graph in general. So what, what makes it random? So Edris and Renly introduced the specific model of randomness. So you have some number of nodes, n let's say, and then you put down edges between these nodes uh, at random with some probability p for every pair of nodes, and all these edges are dependent of each other. Okay, so having an edge between nodes a and b doesn't tell you anything whether there's going to be an edge between b and c. The probability is the same, it's p. Okay, so this uh, random object is described by two parameters, n and p. Uh, and what uh, they did is to study the properties of this family of models for large m. So we let n go to infinity and ask uh, what properties does this model have? And we may allow p to scale with n in some way. Uh, okay, and this is, uh, and this large n limit is somehow relevant for many of uh, the kinds of networks we are going to be interested in because, uh, well, typically they are made up of thousands to millions of nodes. Uh, so uh, hopefully the intuition from these uh, mathematical models is relevant to the networks. Okay, so uh, uh, let, let me tell you about some of the properties of these Edersheni random graphs. So the first scaling we look at is to take the edge probability p to be some constant over n. Uh, so if we look at any one node, uh, it has n minus 1 potential edges because there are n minus 1 other nodes it can have edges too. Each is present with probability p which is c over n. So this says that the mean degree of a node, the mean number of neighbors it has is c. Okay. Uh, and uh, the first result that uh, Edish and Renyi derived is that if this uh, constant C is smaller than 1, uh, then this random graph is made up of small connected components. So if you ask what, what are the sizes of the connected components of this graph, they are all only logarithmic <coughs> in the number of nodes. They are quite small. But if C is bigger than 1, then there's a sudden transition some fraction of the population is connected. So there's one uh, so-called giant component of size alpha n, a fraction of the whole population, and all the other components remain small. So somehow, as C crosses this threshold of one, suddenly a lot of these small components join up to make one big component. Uh, and this is typical of a lot of uh, properties that random graphs have. You have this, uh, what's called threshold behavior. Some property suddenly goes, it's not that the property, the probability of having a big component gradually rises. It, it goes from zero to one abruptly, very close to zero to very close to one abruptly, at, at this threshold of z equals one. Uh, and similarly, we can ask, uh, what's the probability that the graph as a whole is connected? So it consists of a single connected component of size n. Uh, that transition happens not for p, which is a constant times n. You need something bigger. You need a constant times log n over n. And if this constant is bigger than 1, then the graph is connected with probability close to 1. If it's smaller than 1, it's disconnected with probability close to 1. Okay. 
connectivity. So the probability of being connected goes from 0 to 1 abruptly again at this lambda equals 1. And we can even look uh, more closely at this transition, uh, what happens at lambda equals 1. So we can look at log n taking the edge probability to be log n plus something over n. Uh, and the connectivity probability has this double exponential decay of e to the minus e to the minus c. So, so these, uh, the main point I want to get across is that uh, there's a lot understood about these models and some very uh, precise estimates about quantities we might be interested in, like the probability of connectivity. Okay, so why uh, why is this uh, uh, relevant to peer-to-peer -peer networks, for instance? So, so how might we construct such networks? So, one very simple approach would be to say, uh, let's just uh, make these connections at random. So, we have, um, uh, oh, so, so we might, uh, for now, let's suppose that we have uh, one. Uh, one node playing a special role. Ideally, we don't want any centralized nodes, but let's say we have a node uh, which plays the role of being in charge of the membership. So you subscribe to a group, and uh, this uh, central node, this membership server, gives you a set of other nodes to make links to. And it could choose randomly from the existing membership and give you, suggest members to you, and you form links to them. Uh, and the goal should be to ensure that the uh, P2P network as a whole is connected. Well, to do that, how many links do you need? Um, that, that depends on how, uh, how this uh, network is structured. But what the result tells us is we could do this just at random. Rather than think about how to structure this network, let's just uh, pick our uh, neighbors at random. Uh, and if we do that, then you don't need to uh, maintain a very large number of links. You only need to maintain of the order of log n links. So if you have a P3 network with a million nodes, uh, you need maybe somewhere 15 links or so, uh, and that ensures global connectivity. Okay. So, so it, gives, uh, it gives an idea of how to size uh, the network. Uh, you can also ask questions like, what happens if some of these nodes or links might fail? They might leave the network temporarily or permanently. So how big should we, uh, how many links should be maintained to be able to cope with these failures? And if we have some idea of the failure rate, so let's say we think that 10% of uh, nodes will leave the network over some time period of interest, so that, that says the failure rate is alpha is 0.1, uh, then the Edwish-Remy model tells us how to increase the connectivity. So if we maintain a mean number of links of log n over 1 minus alpha, then we can tolerate a fraction alpha of failures and still retain connectivity. Okay, so this is an example of how uh, insights from random graphs can be used to uh, build P2P net. Um, okay, so some other random graph models I should mention. Do we need that high connectivity? Do we need log n neighbors? Okay, it's not very much, but maybe we could do with even less. Uh, it turns out the answer is yes, and again, there are random graph models we can use to talk about that. Uh, so uh, the class of models that are relevant is what are called random regular graphs. Uh, here. Uh, in the Edwish-Renyi model, if you look at the degree of any node, that itself is random because each connection is made randomly. So the number of friends or links you end up with is random. It's, it's actually a Poisson distribution. Uh, but you could make that deterministic. You can say, I want to make sure I have 10 friends, but then I'll choose those 10 friends randomly. Uh, and that's what random regular graphs do. So you have some fixed degree k and then you randomly choose your neighbors. Um, 
And then again, we can ask questions such as, is the resulting graph connected? And the answers are known. So it's known, for instance, that three regular graphs are connected. So it's enough if everybody has three neighbors. Okay, so long as you choose graphs randomly from this set of graphs with three neighbors, uh, then the graph will be connected. Uh, the abbreviation there, WHB, is with high probability. So with probability going to one as n goes to infinity. So in the large graph limit, these graphs will be guaranteed to be connected. Uh, three regular graphs are not easy to construct. Um, they are easy to describe, but you can't, in a decentralized way, construct them. Uh, what you might construct is, say, a four-out random graph. So you could say every member joining this network gets uh, four other members chosen at random given to it, and it forms links to them. Uh, a graph made up that way is guaranteed to be connected. So in fact, you don't even need a degree of log n, a degree of 4 is enough. Um, however, while this is enough, this is not quite as robust to failure. So if you want to tolerate some fraction of nodes failing, you do need the log n threshold. You are back to the edge of any setting. Okay, so random regular graphs are fine if you think nothing's going to fail, but they are not, not so robust. Uh, so that's uh, one example of a class of uh, different class of graph models. So a few others. Um, scale free or power law graphs. These, these, I won't say much about them, but I should mention them because there's been a lot of uh, uh, talk about them recently. The, the motivation comes from the fact that if you look at, say, the edges Renyi model and you look at the node degrees, as I mentioned, they have a Poisson distribution. What that means is that if you look at the tail of this distribution, if you ask what's the probability that a node has k neighbors, that decays exponentially in k. Uh, so you don't have very high degree nodes. Uh, and this is somehow unrepresentative of real world networks where you do have uh, many such networks do have much heavier tails. So if you look at how many neighbors, uh, say, there are in the internet, then there are core routers which have very large degree. So you have, you find, in fact, polynomial decay rather than exponential decay. And it is possible to construct random graph models with these properties. Uh, and they have quite similar properties with regard to connectivity and so on. Um, in the case of peer-to-peer -peer networks, perhaps these are not as relevant because in some sense having very high degrees is somehow moving more towards a central system, towards a system of super peers which have high degrees. Uh, and if you want something which is not so centralized, you might want to design that feature out. Okay, one other uh, model that I uh, would like to mention is what are called uh, random geometric graphs <coughs> or spatial graphs. Uh, in all the other models we've mentioned so far, all nodes have been, in some sense, uh, uh, identical to each other. So uh, there was no preference between nodes for who connects with whom. You, you choose randomly. Uh, in many applications, there is, there is uh, Spatial location is important. You, you occupy some point in, you, you have a geographical location and you would like to make links with those who are close by geographically. Say for instance, if you're using wireless devices, you might want to do that. Uh, and we could model that uh, by having some, by specifying a probability distribution for where the nodes are placed. The simplest one might be, say, they are uniformly at random, or say, a unit square. Uh, and we, we'd have to specify the probability there's an edge between two nodes, and this would depend in some way on the distance between uh, And again, a simple example might be to say, if the distance is smaller than some threshold, you make a link. If it's bigger than that, there's no link. Uh, and so, with these two assumptions, uniform on, uh, uniformly at random on the square and edges if you're within some distance threshold, 
that's called a random geometric graph, uh, and uh, properties of that are known. So you can ask how many neighbors on average do you need in order to ensure there's a giant component that, that there are a, that there's a component containing a fraction of all the nodes. Uh, it is known that there's a threshold for this. It's called the population threshold, uh, and the num it's known that a constant number of neighbors suffices, but it's not known what this constant is, a constant mean number of neighbors, okay? So we know there's a threshold, we don't know where the threshold is. Uh, in order to ensure full connectivity, that everybody uh, can talk to everybody else, you need a mean degree of log n. In this case, it's a mean degree around log n, so it's not known even whether there is a threshold. So some called C1 times log n is not enough and C2 times log n is enough. And there are estimates of C1 and C2. So there may be a threshold somewhere in between, but that's all we know about this. Okay. Uh, small world networks, so these are some a way of combining features of uh, uh, geometric and Edwards-Renyi random graphs. Uh, they've become quite popular through uh, uh, the book of uh, Strogatz and Watts. Uh, and they, they are somehow also seen as uh, good models of social networks where there's some uh, tendency to have links with people close, uh, close by geographically or in some other metric and also to have some number of random long-range connections. Uh, so as a mathematical model of these, uh, we could have nodes placed, let's say, again, random on the square, but you could have any distribution you like. Um, you could also, uh, and then you have this geometric component where the nodes are connected to neighbors within some range. Uh, and in addition to this uh, geometric component, you have this random Edwards-Renyi type long-range contacts, which are chosen at random. So let's uh, look in a bit more detail at two such models. Uh, so in the first model, each node makes links to k of its nearest neighbors, where k is uh, some constant. It's the same for every node. Uh, it may depend on n, but it's it's uh, it's the same for every node. It's not random. And then, uh, so these are the nearest neighbor links. And then you also make, just like the Edwards-Renyi model, you make random links with probability p between any two nodes. That's one. The second model is very similar. The random links are the same, but the nearest neighbor links, instead of being a fixed number, are going to be a random number. You take a fixed radius and connect to everyone within that. And because the nodes are placed at random, that means you have a random number of neighbors. Okay. They look very similar. They have somewhat different connectivity properties. So if you look at mean degree, it's uh, uh, in the first case, you have k nearest neighbors plus np long-range long neighbors. That's the mean degree. And we can show that this model is connected with high probability if the product of the local degree and the long-range degree is bigger than c log n for any c bigger than 1. Okay. So the product of these has to be bigger than log n. For the second model, the mean degree is, well, you're connected to everyone within an area pi r squared. The node density is n, n nodes in the unit square, so that's your number of uh, local neighbors, and again, np long-range neighbors. And in this case, we can show uh, that if, uh, if the sum of these is smaller than log n, then you are disconnected. So somehow, model B needs more neighbors in order to be connected than model A. That's, uh, that's the idea. So we can characterize precisely uh, the connectivity properties of these two properties. Okay, so that was uh, uh, a 
kind of quick overview of some properties of random graph models and how they are useful for sizing peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, at least uh, in terms of degree distributions. Um, I mentioned that one way to achieve this might be to have a central kind of a membership server assigning uh, uh, each subscriber a random subset of members to form links with. But could we somehow get rid of the central server and do everything in a fully peer-to-peer -peer manner? Could we have a network that builds itself, repairs itself without uh, uh, any uh, coordination, central, centralized coordination? So the kinds of things that we might need to do in order to achieve this, well, if we want to maintain log n links, somehow we need to estimate the number of nodes n, and we need to do this even though n is changing all the time because nodes are joining and leaving. Uh, then we have to make random links. We need not just log n links, but log n chosen uniformly at random to have these guarantees. So how do we sample nodes uniformly at random? Uh, we can address each of these questions separately, but what I'm, uh, well, something is not so hard. Estimation is a bit harder. You can sample with log n effort, uh, but the best algorithm we need, uh, we know of for estimating the size of uh, the system, estimating n takes of the order of square root n samples in order to estimate it, and it uses a variant of the birthday paradox to do that. Uh, that's quite expensive, so ideally we don't want to have to estimate 10. Uh, and I want to suggest an algorithm which somehow gets around doing the estimate explicitly. Uh, so this is a protocol we developed, and uh, the idea here is that nodes uh, only maintain links to a small number of other nodes, which we call the local views. Uh, and as new nodes subscribe or nodes depart, then these local views change uh, and our claim is that somehow they converge to some desired multiple of log n and C, the multiple is a design parameter we can choose. Okay. So we'll illustrate this with C equals 1, but the algorithm can be modified for any C. Okay, so... Uh, the algorithm works as follows. So I've called a certain node the server, but that it's not a special server. It, it's an arbitrary node in the P2P network that's going to play the role of server for a new request, a new subscription request. So a new, a new member who wants to join the group, uh, the subscriber S, comes into the system, uh, picks a node at random somehow. We'll come to how later and sends it a subscription request. What the server does is it forwards this request to every one of its neighbors, okay. every, one, every member of its local view. Uh, so it forwards uh, whatever, the IP address of this new node to every uh, such node. Uh, and then these nodes which receive the subscription request, they can do one of two things. They can either accept it, which they do with some probability. We have taken it to be uh, the reciprocal of their view size. So somehow that's, that does some load balancing. If you already have a big view size, you don't accept requests, you forward them on. If you have a small view size, you accept them and form links. Uh, so if you decide to accept it, you uh, form a link to this uh, new node. And if you decide not to accept it, then you choose now just one member of your local view at random and forward it on. And then that person, that node does the same and it keeps getting forwarded until eventually it's accepted. Okay, and the claim is that this algorithm somehow ensures that the view sizes converge to log n, and I'll give some intuition about why. But just to illustrate again in a bit more detail, so let's say we have some existing network. Uh, there's node zero with, uh, uh, with, which has three other nodes in its local view. 
Uh, along comes a new node which wants to subscribe. It sends a subscription request to node zero, which forwards it on to every member of its local view. Okay, node four uh, has only node seven in its local view, and it decides to accept the request, let's say. So it forms a link to six, which means that it puts node six in its local view and will also inform uh, node six that it has accepted it. Um, node one decides not to accept it, forwards it on to one of its neighbors, say node three, which accepts it and so on. Node five decides not to accept it, forwards it to eight, which again decides not to accept it, etc., etc. And eventually, uh, you, you can't drop the request, you have to forward it. So uh, eventually every one of these three forwardings will result in one acceptance, okay? So node six will now end up in the local views of three nodes. And three because the server in sent its request two had a degree of three. And that's, that's the point uh, you should keep in mind. So that's random, it happened to be three, so it was replicated in three views. So if we do an average case analysis of what the degrees look like, uh, so along comes this new node, it goes to, let's say, a random node, which is going to act as the server for it. Uh, its view size, let's say, is the average, currently, dk, when there are k nodes present. So now there's going to be one more node present, and how many arcs were added? How many new links were added? Uh, DK was, nodes accepted the new members, so DK links were added, and the new member formed a link to one node to which it subscribed, so that's plus one. So there were DK plus one links added. So uh, when nodes leave, unless they leave in a well-behaved way, behaved way of informing other nodes they are leaving, etc. Uh, questions like, so how do you choose your initial server at random? Or how do you sample a node at random? That's quite easy to do. Um, and the way to do that is to, uh, uh, is to run a random walk on your existing network. And you choose your random walk to have assets uh, invariant distribution. If the walk goes on for long enough, what's its probability distribution on the network? That should be the uniform distribution. So choose the probabilities to ensure that the invariant distribution for the random walk is uniform and run the random walk long enough to make sure it's mixed to its invariant distribution. It's got close to that. Uh, and it turns out that log n steps <coughs> are enough for it to mix. So it, it's not, you don't have to run it for very long. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, so I, uh, uh, well, we all know that peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks have been uh, growing enormously in popularity and are used for a variety of different things. Um, and what I uh, hope I've convinced you is that uh, mathematical models of random graphs uh, are very useful in gaining insights into how to design and build such networks.